And good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you doing? Dr. Roddenberry coming to you from my office here on South Campus uh, <clears throat> in Fuqua Verena. How's everybody doing today? Looks like we have a small audience building. Let's go ahead and see if we can jump that number up. If you're in the chat bar, go ahead and type in a hello. How are you doing, uh, viewer? It's good to see you. Thanks for coming today. I do appreciate that. Oh, there we go. a couple other people. <coughs> <clears throat> so I hope everybody's having a good day so far. Hey, Gustavo. Oh, are you, uh, you're still in the Dominican today, right? How's, uh, how's everything going in the Dominican today? Hello, Mariah. Hi, Martine. Good to see you. Fantastic. Yep. Cool. Nice. What'd you have good for uh, dinner this weekend? Did you get some good home cooked food? What's popular in, in uh, on your island, bud? Wow, it's great to see everybody. Thanks, Martine. How are you doing, Martine? Good to see you, sir. Right, right. That is a that's a drag. Oh, Mariah, how are you doing? Thanks for coming to class today. I hope you're doing all right. Y'all ready for summer to be over? Good morning, Dale. Good to see you. Thanks for coming. It's great to see you. Great to see everybody. Well, I really want to thank you for coming today. Uh, we're talking about Chapter 8, IQ Testing. So let's go ahead and uh, I'm doing well, Mariah. I'm doing well. Thanks. I appreciate you asking. So let's see. Uh, chapter 8, we talked about IQ testing yesterday. I suggested to you a definition of intelligence and asked you if these people were intelligent. I suggested to you that IQ testing and testing in general has taken over the world. There are four different areas of subfields of psychologists who use IQ testing and they use them in these different settings, schools, courts, clinical settings like at the doctor, uh, doctor's office and then in business settings. And then uh, I mentioned to you uh, the guy that didn't invented him was a French fellow named Alfred Binet, and he uh, tried to figure out how old your mind was and compare it to how old your body was. Um, I told you about how popular IQ tests came after World War I. If you weren't here yesterday, I mentioned that the first widespread use of IQ testing was by the U.S. military in World War I, and it took the world by a storm. And then we have lots of different kinds of tests. We have the Wechsler scales, which are used in clinical settings. They're a one-on-one -on -one test. And then I compared those with various paper and pencil IQ tests, Woodcock-Johnson, the ASVAB, and the Wonderlic, which are all paper and pencil questions. Um, and those are designed to classify people in normal distributions. And the Wechsler scales are used more for diagnosing uh, psychological intellectual problems. I told you that modern IQ scores use this idea called the deviation method now. What we do is we compare you to those people who are uh, of the same age as you and we try to answer the question how well do you score in an IQ test compared to your peer group and what we suggested is that if you give people IQ tests what you're going to find is that it's normally distributed most people are in the middle we have some people at either extreme, we call them gifted, or uh, maybe intellectually uh, disabled. Now, here we are. <clears throat> oh, good morning, Julieth. Good to see you this morning. I was just giving a recap on yesterday's lecture. So here we are. What exactly is intelligence? Uh, the first guy, Alfred Binet, who developed the first IQ test really didn't think too much about the question of what IQ uh, uh, intelligence was. He wasn't asked to, to create an IQ, an intelligence test. Instead, he was asked to develop a test which showed that some, which would identify students that needed extra help in class. So he created this one test with the purpose of identifying this, these types of students. So really, you can think of him as having what we might call a G concept of IQ. 
he thought of IQ as one individual thing you might measure. Like, for example, I could measure your weight. And we all have one number which represents our weight. Or we could try to classify people by talking about their height. And I could say, you know what, one way of classifying people is by their height. And we all have one number for that. So you can think of the first IQ test as thinking about uh, this aptitude, this human aptitude, in terms of a unitary ability. Let's call that G. All right. Now, uh, after about 20 years of IQ test development, uh, people began to have real concerns and real uh, questions about whether or not we should think about intelligence as just this one uh, crystallized thing that we all have. How many of you have ever had the experience? I notice we have four viewers here. How many of you have ever had the experience that you're really good at math, but you're not so good at history and English? Or are you the opposite way? You are really good at history and English, but you're not as good at math. Hmm? How many of you have had that kind of experience? Do you, or do you feel like you excel in everything the same? Exactly, Gustavo. So one of the things you can begin to wonder about is maybe we should think about intelligence in sort of multiple areas instead. So uh, after the first IQ tests were developed and people like Sternberg and these other, uh, excuse me, Wexler, David Wexler started developing their IQ tests, we had these questions uh, which uh, we, we had this debate about whether or not IQ was one thing or multiple things. I uh, don't want to bore you with the details of this debate, except, except to suggest that a compromise was reached between the group of people who thought that IQ was one thing, that intelligence was one thing, and those people who thought that IQ was multiple things, the S group of people. So we now think of IQ in these terms. You can think of your IQ uh, or your intelligence, if you will, as being this one thing, <clears throat> that is independently composed of two separate things. So, modern IQ test, when you go take an IQ test, <clears throat> you will get one number, which represents your full-scale IQ, right? And so if we go back to this right here, each and every one of us who ever took an IQ test got one number, uh, which represents our overall IQ score, and that's going to be somewhere on this range. And most of us, if you are like me, most of us are probably somewhere from 100 to 115. Okay. Now, if you actually look at a real IQ profile done by the WACE, you know, the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale, or actually any one of these, the Woodcock Johnson will do the same thing. What it's going to do, it's then going to show you subparts, which break IQ down into different parts. So, yes, we do have this thing you might call an overall cleverness about you. But we all also have what you might call a verbal IQ and a nonverbal or mathematical or performance IQ. Okay? So you can think of our intellectual function, our IQ abilities, as possessing our ability to reason with words and our ability to reason with symbols. And if you look at the brain, what you're going to notice is that the left half of your brain is more verbal and focuses more on words, and the right half of your brain is more of a symbolic, abstract, artistic part of your brain. So you can think of the IQ test as giving you an overall number, which measures uh, the brain in general, but then you can break it down, and your full IQ report is going to tell you how... Uh, well the left half functions and how well the right half functions. You see that? And then uh, in a, uh, the real IQ test, they're actually going to then break the verbal and the performance down into very specific subtasks or specific abilities. So for example, what kinds of specific abilities uh, go into making up your verbal IQ? Well, do you see down here uh, on this box underneath me, your digit span is considered part of your verbal IQ. I was talking to you uh, uh, Tuesday or Monday about your short-term memory span, the length of the size of your short-term memory. That's actually a quality that's measured on an IQ test, 
and it's seen as being part of your verbal ability. Now, uh, your vocabulary, the number of words that you know, your vocabulary is seen as being part of your verbal ability. Your ability to know the similarities and differences between objects and to elaborate on those is thought of as a verbal ability. Did you know that your knowledge for your uh, basic math, your uh, multiplications, your addition, and your subtraction, did you know that we don't actually process that information in the math circuits of our brain on the left side or on the right side? We actually process simple mathematics in our verbal sphere because we've learned them by rote. You don't do the calculations when I ask you 3 plus 1. You've just learned the fact that 3 plus 1 equals 4. And so uh, what we can do, what we do when you get a full IQ report is you're going to get a full scale number which represents the top, the general IQ, which is used to compare you in school, all right? But then the other report's going to then break your IQ abilities down into specific qualities that go feed into that larger IQ. So we've got verbal reasoning and we've got nonverbal reasoning. And then we've got very specific tasks that are supposed to feed into those abilities. Now, why am I telling you all of this stuff? You might say, Chris, this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't matter. When they're trying to diagnose a learning disorder, when we're trying to diagnose a learning disorder, uh, psychologists look for patterns in your scores that represent narrow difficulties. I see we're losing some people. Is my, uh, how's my sound going? Uh, is it just a boring lecture? Or uh, is it the fact that the, uh, it looks like I'm having some technical problems here. <laughs> Okay, but when they look for uh, learning disorders, a learning disorder is, is, oh no. Okay, let me see what we got going on here. Sound is good for you? Okay, looks like you might be the only one I have, Mariah. Oh well. All right, and so here's the deal, Mariah. Um, when they're diagnosing a learning disorder, they're looking for a specific pattern of disabilities in these specific scores. So the diagnosis of a learning disorder is someone who has uh, uh, a specific uh, difficulty with one part of academic functioning uh, and, and is otherwise has a normal IQ. All right, so school, primary school, K through 12, is designed so that everybody can pass through it. Everybody should be able to get through uh, 12th grade in high school. That's, uh, the pro public education is set up like that. So if you are not doing well in school, let's say you're failing third grade or failing second grade, we then know that you, as a child, have some sort of school-related problem. Now, we take you in and give you an IQ test. Now, your IQ test may score may score in the 70 range. And if it scores in the 70 range, then we know why you're not doing well in school. You may have an intellectual disability. On the other hand, some kids are going to score in the normal range. They may have an IQ of 105 or 110, but for some reason, they aren't doing well in one area of school. So we then go look at the subtests. And what you're going to find is that uh, you can diagnose learning disorders by seeing people who have normal IQ scores, 110, but one of these specific subscales will be really, really low, demonstrating a limited problem that child has with academic functioning. For example, do you see where it says digit span? Digit span, uh, and <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, digit span, and then if you look over on the far right where it says digit symbol coding, both of those tasks take focus and the ability to pay attention. What you might notice is a child will score 
uh, 110 on their IQ, but when you look at their specific skills, what you're going to notice is that they score super duper low on their digit span and their digit symbol coding. And so what you then say is, hey, that child has a normal IQ, but they have difficulty with tasks that require attention. That child has attention deficit disorder. And so in a clinical setting, what they do is they look at this overall number, the full scale IQ, but then we also look at sub abilities, which are said to create that intelligence. Because you know that your, you your intelligence isn't one unitary thing, it's pieces. Remember, it's modular, just like the rest of your intellectual functioning. All right, now, when the military is looking at you, they're looking at one number, okay? If you take the scholastic aptitude test and your college is looking at your scores, they're looking at one number. If you're taking the Wonderlick and you're applying to become a police officer or you're going into the NFL and those businesses measure your IQ, they're looking at one number. That's a great way to classify normal people. However, if you want to diagnose somebody who has a, uh, a learning disorder, what you need to do is look at the subscores because the person with the learning disorder is going to have a normal IQ, 1 to 115, maybe even a little bit higher. But what you're going to notice is that one or more of their sub-skills is going to be show a huge deficit. And that's how we can figure out and diagnose learning disorders. Thank you, Luis uh, Gustavo, for the uh, Kazunheit. The, the God bless you. Now, here's one thing. Uh, as soon as IQ tests were created, if you think about it, intelligence, aptitude, cleverness is a pretty important quality. Society really, really values that. As soon as somebody uh, created an IQ test that had this ability to sort and classify people, people started asking the question, is this quality inherited or is it learned from your environment? In fact, you may not know this, but there is a uh, branch of science called eugenics. I just typed it in the chat bar. Uh, an entire branch of applied science that existed here in the United States for over 70 years, uh, where the government forcibly sterilized people who had low IQs. And the idea was we wanted to stop their low IQ genes from being transmitted to the next, uh, the next generation. Did you folks know that? Did you know that people were forcibly sterilized in North Carolina up until 1970? 1970, the Supreme Court actually said that it was okay, it was constitutional to sterilize people who were deemed unintelligent. And so as soon as we had this way of measuring intelligence and people began to become interested in making mankind better, uh, we had this huge debate. Is intelligence something that you're born with or something that you develop. The eugenics believe that you were born with it and that we should breed human beings to uh, get rid of low IQ genes. On the other hand, the behaviors, which I introduced to you last week, uh, you know, B.F. Skinner and his colleagues, they really believe that every part of humans was learned from the environment. Okay. Do you see the difference here? That's why uh, the behaviors, when I was preaching you, to you about the behaviors last week in chapter six, and I kept saying they cared about environment, to them it was all environment, 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 environment. They were actually opposed to the eugenists who wanted to use selective sterilization. And so there was this huge debate, is IQ something that is inherited? IQ is multifaceted. You're right, Jadija. And that's sort of what I was trying to suggest right here. There are a lot of specific abilities that go into your intellectual ability, right? And uh, you, some components are genetic and some are not. Wow, that's an, interesting, uh, that's an interesting point of view. I'm not sure if 
uh, if they've if behavioral genetics geneticists have looked at specific components of intelligence. But that's a hell of a theory. I really like the way you're thinking. But uh, research was done uh, to try and tease out the environmental and genetic effects of IQ. Behavioral genetics is the scientific approach that tries to assess the impact of genes on a particular trait or behavior. And so what they do is, in behavioral genetics, it's fairly simple. What you do is you find a trait of interest. It could be person, your scores on personality tests. It could be handedness. It could be your sexual preference. In this case, it happens to be your IQ score. And what they do is they give people IQ scores and then compare how correlated IQ scores are between people of similar genetic material. So, for example, your, uh, you share uh, half of each of your parents' genetic material. Okay, so you share half of your genes with your parents. If you, if you have regular siblings, you share a quarter of genetic material with your brother or sister. If you have an identical twin, you share 100% genetic material. Okay, so we've got three situations, brothers and sisters, regular brothers and sisters, 25% similar genetically. Parents and children, 50% genetically similar. Uh, identical twins, 100% genetically similar. What you then do is look at the concordance or agreement or similarity in scores between these different groups of people. And what you would expect is if genes control a trait, then the more genetically similar someone is to another person, the more similar their quality of interest will be. All right? And so uh, what you've got underneath of you are some some charts showing some behavioral uh, genetics factors. If you look over on this far uh, far uh, uh, screen, what they show you um, is that you can look at people. Uh, uh, so you can look at uh, siblings who are raised together and raised apart. Look at this. We've got the siblings raised together and raised apart. Excuse me, and they've got 50% genetic similarity. I screwed that up. 50% genetic similarity. Now, you see that they have some siblings that were raised together and some siblings that were raised apart. And then if you look up the y-axis, you'll see IQ correlation. And what you'll see is that there's a higher correlation or higher agreement in IQ scores between siblings that are raised together than those that are raised apart. So, both of these groups share the same genetic material. So the fact that the ones raised together um, have a higher correlation shows you that environment kind of affects uh, your IQ scores. So to a certain degree, environment does matter. Okay, now, if you then compare adopted uh, siblings, adopted siblings to... Uh, to um, uh, adoptive siblings that share zero genetic material with, uh, let's see, siblings uh, raised together, what you're going to see is that the correlation is much higher for siblings uh, than it is for adopted siblings. And so what you can see there is that there is a genetic component as well. Um, if you look at the IQ between identical twins and fraternal twins raised together, what you're going to see is that identical twins' IQs are very highly correlated. Now, fraternal twins still have a pretty high IQ score, but those fraternal twins have, uh, identical twins have a much higher correlation between IQ scores. So what I want you to see here is that the chart on the left side says that your genes do have a strong effect on your IQ scores, but the effect of environment is not zero, is not zero. 
Now, look at this chart underneath me. If you remember in chapter four, I suggested to you that one of the risk factors in pregnancy is having a low birth weight baby. In fact, I suggested to you that uh, having a low birth weight is problematic enough that if a mother comes in and is addicted to opiates, instead of having her quit cold turkey and risking her accidentally going into labor and having a low birth weight baby, they will use a maintenance program, a methadone program, and they would rather have the baby be born a little bit addicted to methadone than to be, uh, than to be born early and be low birth weight. If you look right here underneath me, what you're going to notice is that IQ is associated with birth weight. Low birth weight babies do tend to have lower IQ scores than babies who are taken uh, that are of, of, of normal birthing size. And so you can see how environment does affect IQ. So what I want you to take away from this is that behavioral genetics uh, represents the attempt to try and figure out how much of a human quality is determined by genes. I want you to know that IQ tests have always been the center of a huge, huge debate about whether or not uh, genes or environment are more important. In fact, I want you to know that that's the reason that the behaviors took such a strong environmental position. And I do want you to know that uh, birth weight is an environmental factor that really does affect uh, people's IQ scores. Okay? Great questions, by the way. Thank you, Jadija. Now, let's talk a little bit about the quality of IQ tests. This is a, a, a slide 9B or slide 8B now. Here's the deal. IQ tests hold an incredible amount of power in our society. Did you know, based on your IQ scores in third grade, your whole educational path can be changed? If you score high enough on an IQ test in third grade, they will give you, uh, they will send you to uh, supplemented education and make your intellectual performance even better. If your IQ score is low, or you have problems with IQ tests, you may put, be put into special classes in different classes designed to help you with whatever weakness you may have. So edge IQ tests are important in determining your educational path in school. You know what? They can affect your legal standing. Did you know that it's considered unconstitutional to educate somebody with an intellectual deficiency? Somebody whose IQ is below 70 uh, and shows impaired functioning is immune from the death penalty, from the death penalty. So that's huge, uh, huge role that IQ tests play. And also, IQ tests are really, really important in the diagnosis of psychological disorders. So, uh, and they're also used in hiring decisions. Holy cow, IQ tests have a huge impact over your life. They rule your life. Think about it. ASVAB tests determine what kind of soldier you're going to be. The scholastic aptitude test decides whether or not you go to a fancy college or a regular college. IQ tests can determine whether or not you go to gifted education in third grade or whether or not you go to special education in third grade. IQ tests... Uh, can save you from the death penalty. They're incredibly important. So it is very important that IQ tests, whatever they measure, they measure it well, okay? And think of a, an IQ test, a psychological test, is a tool, a measurement tool. Just like, just like a bathroom scale measures how much you weigh or a tape measures, measures how long something is, right? Um, just like any of these things are measurement tools, an IQ test is also a measurement tool. And so just like we want your bathroom scale to be accurate, just like we want your, your tape measure to be accurate, uh, just like we want any of these things to be accurate, we want IQ tests to be accurate, especially if they can affect your life. 
Now, um, it is important that they make accurate measurements. There are actually a group of psychologists, it's a subfield, we didn't really talk about it in chapter one uh, because it's not a very big subfield, but there are uh, a group of psychologists known as quantitative psychologists, quantitative psychologists. Another name for them is a psychometrician, okay, uh, a psyche measurer. And quantitative psychologists and psychometricians are the ones who make sure that psychological tests are both reliable and valid. Did you know that the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where I go to, is one of six quantitative psychology programs in the United States? Actually, it might be more by now, but it was one of the few quantitative uh, programs, and it's where you could go and get tests and, and learn how to evaluate and develop uh, psychometric instruments. Okay, now, two qualities of IQ tests that we are really, really important, that are re we're really interested in. The test's reliability and the test's validity. The reliability is probably more foundational. Reliability asks the question, does the test give you the same measurement every time you measure the same person? So think about this, a bathroom scale. If you jump on a bathroom scale, it should give you the same measurement every time. Unless you lose a bunch of weight, you should get the same measurement. For example, if I step off of my bathroom, if I have a bathroom scale right here, and I measure myself 10 times in a row, I should get the same measurement. If I have a bathroom scale and I jump on it the first time and it says I weigh 95 pounds and then I get off and I jump on that bath scale and it says you weigh 210 pounds and then I get off of it and I jump on it a third time and it says I'm 150 pounds. So I've measured myself three times. The bathroom scale said I was 90 pounds, it said I was 200 pounds, and it said I was 150 pounds. This is an unreliable instrument, right? I can't use this bathroom scale at all because it is totally unreliable. The same concept holds for an IQ test. We want to make sure that it is reliable. Does it give us the same measurement each time we measure the same thing? Now, how can you test reliability? Well, one of the things you can do is you can give a person a test multiple times and they should score the same each time they take the test. Or, you know what you can do? You can actually split the test into the even items and the odd items. And then when the person takes the test, you can correlate their score on the odd items and the even items. If you have 100 item tests, uh, you should score the same on the odd items as you do on the even items. If you don't, there's some internal invalid, unreliability going on. And... If you have uh, the Stanford Binet IQ test, which is one IQ test, and then you take the Wechsler IQ test, both of these tests should give you should give you uh, about the same measure for your IQ. All right, does that make sense? Now, here's what I will tell you: IQ tests, whatever they measure, and I'm not saying they necessarily measure all of what it means to be intelligent. But whatever IQ tests measure can be reliably measured starting at the age of four. Did you know that, reliable, that personality cannot be reliably measured until the age of 17 or 18? But your IQ can be reliably measured by around the age of four. So your IQ, whatever it is, appears to be set around the age of four. Here's the crazy notion. If you score in the 75th percentile for four-year-olds, when we test you in 10 years, you're probably going to score in the 75th percentile for 14-year-olds. If we wait 20 more years and measure you at 34, you know what we're going to find? You're probably in the 75th percentile again. Whatever IQ tests measure, they seem to do it pretty, pretty reliably. Okay? Now, <clears throat> a second quality of an IQ test, and this is where IQ tests are a little more problematic. Does the tool measure what it is intended to measure? All right. So let's say this is a ridiculous example. Let's say I jumped on my bathroom scale and it said, uh, you know, to weigh myself. And it said, you are six foot four. 
That's not what I'm looking to measure. When I jump on a set scale, I'm looking to measure my weight. But what if instead the measurement I get says six foot four, which is length? So I'm not getting the measurement that I intended to get from that tool. Now that's an obvious example because height and weight make sense to us as different things. But one of the things that we have to ask ourselves when we develop an IQ test is, is this test measuring what we think it measures? So the IQ test is reliable, but does it really measure your intelligence? Does it matter? Your, does it measure your intelligence? Now, Here's the deal. If you look at an IQ test, it asks questions about math ability and language ability and general knowledge. Damn sure looks like it measures intelligence. Okay. And so you see I've got a check mark right down here below me. Now, here's the deal. If a test is a... There's no real way to tell if our test is measuring intelligence. There are, however, some indirect ways. One indirect way is to see how well our tests predicts performance in an area that requires the skill we are measuring. All right, follow my logic. School uh, should be easier for those people uh, who have higher intelligence because it takes intelligence to do schoolwork, so we say. So therefore, if our test measures school-related intelligence or intelligence, then it should do well in predicting who's going to do well uh, uh, in an area that takes intelligence. Now, what you might say is that school takes intelligence and work takes intelligence. What I will tell you is that IQ tests are really good at predicting academic performance, especially in early education, uh, grades one through God, probably eight, nine, or 10 at least. If you score uh, well on an IQ test, you should do well in school. In fact, this is why we use IQ tests as a diagnostic tool in determining learning disorders. If you score normally on an IQ test, research has shown, hundreds of years, 100 years of research has shown that people who score well on an IQ test always do well in school. It is very predictive. And so if you have a good IQ score, uh, but you're not doing well in school, we begin looking for other problems that might affect your school performance. But here's the deal. IQ tests are very good at predicting who's going to be a good student. Here's the, uh, here's the uh, more important question. Do IQ tests predict anything else? Uh, do they predict job performance? Sort of, but not really. IQ will predict what career you may go into. So it will tell us who's going to be the lawyers, who's going to be the doctors, and who's going to be uh, the knucklehead psychology professors, okay? So uh, if you score really high on an IQ test, you're more likely to be a doctor than you are to work as a salesman, right? Uh, and the person who scores lower on the IQ test is going to be more likely to be the salesman than the doctor. However, if you look at doctors and compare doctor IQs, what you're going to find is IQ is not going to tell you who's going to be the best doctor or who's going to be the best lawyer or who's going to be the best performer in whatever given field. IQ tests will tell you who goes into the more abstract fields, but given different fields of adult uh, endeavor, the IQ test is not good at telling you who's going to be the best salesman who's going to be the best business manager, who's going to be the best mechanic. It doesn't tell you that, okay? So uh, here's the question. There are questions regarding the content validity of IQ tests. There are people who say that IQ tests don't measure what it really means to be intelligent. What they argue is that IQ tests only measure school intelligence. And they say that's great. It's useful in school, but they argue that real intelligence is much broader than this stupid IQ test. And they argue that if we use IQ tests as the measure of human quality, we are missing very important things 
about the aspects of, of, of human functioning. Now, uh, one of the main criticisms of IQ tests and their validity is that they show differences among ethnic groups. And if you have, and the question is, uh, should we really think of intelligence as being something that varies among different ethnic groups? Okay, there are, uh, so there are definitely, if you look at the IQ distributions right over here, what you're gonna notice is that Asian students tend to score the highest on these IQ tests. Uh, their average is a little bit higher than your Caucasian students, whose average is a little bit higher than your Hispanic students, who are then a little bit higher than your African American students. No, it does not tell exactly. Boy, Gustavo brings a great point. That's exactly the point that I'm talking about, Gustavo. Yes, you are right. This test does not measure your stick to itiveness, it doesn't measure your creativity, it doesn't measure uh, whether or not you have good uh, organizational skills. There are tons of things that are left out of the IQ test. And more importantly, if we use this test and it shows ethnic differences, we can sometimes, this tool can become a tool for bias among groups now. Right. So here's the deal. When we made these tests up, the early IQ tests showed there, when they're making the early IQ tests, some of the test questions showed differences between males and females. The females would score higher on them. So the test takers said, you know what? That doesn't make sense. So they would throw the questions out that showed a bias towards females. However, in the 19, early 1900s, when these IQ tests were made, any of the questions that showed bias against African Americans or minority groups weren't thrown out because those differences were assumed assumed to exist. So why is it, why is it that questions that show that females are, uh, do better than males are thrown out and questions uh, that show that ethnic groups don't do as well as Caucasians uh, aren't thrown out? And so you might ask your questions, were these tests really created uh, uh, without bias? Who knows? This I, I've got. If you look over here in these comments, I'm not saying one or the other is right. There are fundamental differences among ethnic groups. Maybe the test is biased, more than likely. Um, but nobody knows. If you look, you'll see there's a lot of overlap among these groups. A lot of overlap. So even if there were differences, do these differences really should they affect people's life outcomes? Right. So. Uh, what do we do about these differences? We could design different tests. It turns out that when you look at the, the differences on IQ scores, they mostly occur in the linguistic parts of the test. And so uh, there have been attempts to design tests that uh, use nonverbal reasoning. And in fact, they talk, they talk about it in your book, and I've got it here in your notes. The Raven's Matrices is an IQ test that was designed to test only nonverbal reasoning, putting together puzzles, solving logic problems, et cetera, et cetera. And these tests do not show biases among these different racial groups. So, wow, the Raven's matrices don't show ethnic differences. Here's the problem. The Raven's matrices aren't useful in school. They don't help us diagnose learning disorders. So we can't really use them. Even though we have this test that doesn't show bias, it's not useful in predicting academic performance, so it doesn't work as a diagnostic tool, okay? So what do we do? Do we just uh, tack on an extra 10 points to the Hispanic score when we're evaluating uh, 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 um, 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 candidates for our program. You know, there are some schools which are limiting the number of Asian students, uh, uh, colleges that are limiting the number of Asian candidates because the Asian students score so high on the standardized tests that they're crowding out the other students uh, in, in schools. And uh, there are schools that have these limitations and they are being currently being sued by Asian students who say, hey, this isn't fair. So, what do we do? 
Um, we can't design a test that doesn't show these ethnic differences. And on the other hand, it doesn't seem fair to take them account and make bi judgments against ethnic groups based upon these. So we're really in a pickle with IQ tests. Now, what do I want, what do I want you to take away from that? Just remember that IQ is a very useful clinical tool that can be used in limited school settings and in limited treatment settings to help figure out what, how people's uh, intellectual functioning is working. Should we think of it as something that decides who has quality in the, United, in the world and who doesn't have quality? Absolutely not. The weird thing is when you say IQ score, people have these connotations in their mind about IQ scores, and suddenly people think that's the most important thing. And, when, and there are actually books. There was a book written by a Harvard psychologist uh, called The Bell Curve in the 90s, suggesting that these IQ differences represented real and useful uh, differences between ethnic groups and that we shouldn't even try to educate, uh, we shouldn't worry about them or try to remediate these problems uh, for minority students. It was sort of a, it was a very nativist and some people argue a very racist look at IQ scores because the guy said there are these differences, they're genetic and there's nothing you can do about them. So there's been a lot of debate. The whole history of IQ tests has been uh, littered with the debate, uh, with debates. Uh, is it innate? Is it genetic? Uh, there are differences between these groups. Do they represent real differences and should we treat these groups differently? It's really hard to say. Now, I will tell you, the neat thing about IQ tests or an interesting thing about IQ tests is what you're going to find is that male and female IQ scores are uh, about the same. What you're going to notice, though, uh, actually, uh, I think you're going to notice that uh, female IQ scores are higher on average, but you're going to find uh, more extreme scores with males. So uh, even though I think females have higher on average IQ scores than do males, there are more male uh, geniuses than there are female geniuses, and there are more intellectually uh, uh, disabled males than there are females. So you're actually going to see more males at the ends of the IQ spectrum, although females are higher on average in IQ tests. What point is that, uh, Jadija? Uh, Judith, what point were you uh, trying to make that the IQ tests are potentially racist? Uh, uh, you know, they're very limited in use. Please don't think of classic IQ as the be all end all of a human's worth. Not at all. In fact, I'm getting ready to run out of time here, but I do want to tell you uh, the last several pages of this PowerPoint basically talk about different kinds of intellectual functions, uh, different ways of thinking about intelligence. As soon as we understand the limitations of IQ, it's only good in school settings. It's not good for telling us who's going to be a great job person. Uh, they show differences that we don't qu quite understand that might uh, uh, um, continue uh, racist and, and uh, uh, unfair discriminatory practices in the United States, we need to think about and expand the idea of intellectual functioning. Every smart or dumb people, you'll find more males. Oh, ah, okay, right, right. Okay, so you had a feel for that difference. The test does show a difference between ethnicities, but the question is there, they, the, the distributions overlap so much that you really shouldn't worry about that at all. Instead, think about these larger ways of thinking about intelligence. Over here, there are different theories that try to expand the idea of intelligence. Uh, let's see. The first one, uh, if I could, it, uh, does IQ change as we get older? Does IQ change as we get older? If you look over here at the top, it says fluid and crystallized intelligence. Um, some of the earliest tests of IQ change across the uh, lifespan, especially in older adulthood, 
showed that IQ changes in a very interesting way as we get older. Our facts and our intellectual functioning, uh, our intellectual functioning changes in a very interesting way as we get older. As we move into our 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, what you're going to find is your flexibility of thinking, your creativity, your flexible thinking, your uh, creative problem-solving abilities are going to uh, top out and begin decreasing in your 40s, 50s, and 60s. You're not going to be nearly as creative at my age as you were when you were 20. We'll call that your fluid intelligence. And in fact, uh, as my age, uh, my brain doesn't process information as fast as you 20-year-olds. Now, the reason I've got some, some, uh, some uh, skills and, and, uh, that, that allow me to keep up with you, but in terms of processing power, my ability to think creatively and think fast has decreased. We call that fluid intelligence. But you know what intelligence doesn't seem to go away as you get older? It's your crystallized intelligence, your knowledge for facts. So the first way of differentiating and thinking about IQ differently uh, was done when people started looking at how IQ changes as we get older. And they said, hey, wow, the neat thing is you're going to see that uh, creativity seems to decline much quicker than people's book knowledge. And so you can think of that as fluid versus crystallized knowledge. Now, um, there are then three, these other two art, uh, theories of intelligence, Gar Sternberg's trichic theory of intelligence and Gardner's theory of multiple intelligence. And both of these guys ask the question, can we think of intelligence as being larger than just school stuff? So along with school intelligence, which Sternberg called analytic intelligence, he said we need to think about people's ability to be creative and people's knowledge for what they're supposed to know. So there are things that a nurse is supposed to know that a car mechanic doesn't have to know. There are certain things that a car mechanic should know that a nurse doesn't have to know. Now he called that practical intelligence. So he said we should think about, uh, along with analytical intelligence, we ought to think about creativity and your job-related knowledge as being aspects of intelligence. That's a broader way to think about intelligence. The only problem is he doesn't have a, a test that is useful. So we've got this very useful IQ test, which has a narrow view of what intelligence is, or we have this wonderfully broad theory by Sternberg but it's not useful in clinical settings. And then the same problem uh, exists with Gardner's theory of multiple intelligence. If you remember, I've been talking about modularity all semester long. Gardner suggested we should ha come up with a modular theory of intelligence that tied different intellect that tied your IQ to the different circuits that you have in your brain. And he argued that human beings have seven different types of intelligence. He said, if you can locate it, uh, an ability to a specific area of the brain, show how it matures, and show that damage impairs that ability, then that's a form of intelligence. And he suggests that there are seven forms of intelligence. Linguistic, mathematical, spatial, bodily, kinesthetic, musical, intrapersonal, and interpersonal. And he has an even broader theory of what intelligence means. He has a biologically based theory but just like Sternberg, he also does not have a test that we can use in clinical settings. So, again, we have the IQ test, and we can use that in school settings and clinical settings, but it's not as broad as these other theories of intelligence. So, here's what I want you to take away from IQ tests. IQ tests were developed 120 years ago uh, in France by a fellow named, fellow named Alfred Binet. The goal of these tests was to help us identify academic problems. That was their initial goal. They were uh, the military, U.S. military in World War I used them in it for a different purpose, to classify normal people, okay, groups of normal people to see who's clever versus less clever. And that approach took the world by storm, and suddenly IQ tests became the most important way of classifying human beings as being worthy or not worthy, right? And what I would say is this is problematic because it's created these judge, these questions about whether or not this race is as good as this race, 
uh, whether or not this person should be allowed to procreate and have children versus this race. And really, in the end, IQ tests are only good in academic settings. There are other things that are so much important, more important in the real world, how clever you are, how hardworking you are, uh, like Gustavo mentioned, how organized you are, how well controlled your emotions are. And so we, we should say that IQ tests are just, they're, they're not the whole question point. They're just one little uh, measurement that helps us understand how to treat academic performance in schools. Uh, but we should think about intelligence as being this broader thing that allows us to produce and be effective human beings. You heard from somewhere that big companies use different tests such as creatively, flexibility, and emotional tests. Uh, Gustavo, they probably do. The difficulty with these other tests uh, for creativity and flexibility is it's hard to find a test that is reliable and valid. Remember, I talked about properties of IQ tests. In order uh, to really get the, to, you know, one of the difficult things with tests is getting tests that can be demonstrated to have high validity and high reliability. And creativity, there are tests out there um, and they are of some use. But yeah, and companies are definitely moving that way because they've, uh, we've learned over experience that IQ is not the most important thing. Okay, folks, I have got to go. It's great to see you. I've got my other class starting in four minutes, so I've got to log off and get ready for Psych 118. Have a great day. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be talking about, uh, let's see, chapter chapter uh, 8 and 9. Oh, my goodness. What, tomorrow, oh, motivation and emotion for the next couple of days. We're going to be talking about those. Y'all have a great day, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Bye. <music>